I am putting this slide up as a placeholder uh, because normally when I would begin anything of this form, let's say in 2019 or earlier, I would begin by saying a bunch of very positive things about, about cities. And those many things remain true. They've been said throughout the day by a variety of people. And Lance said many of them. Uh, Astrid said many of them. Uh, this just shows the purely correlational relationship between urbanization in 1960 and subsequent uh, per capita GDP growth rates. Obviously, I, I don't mean to suggest anything remotely causal about this. But it's sort of a provocative looking correlation. And I have occasionally gone so far as to say that you know I can't look at this and think that those policymakers who want to restrict urban growth can take much solace from this, that they're thinking that, that in fact holding cities back is a sensible, uh, uh, a, a sensible strategy. Now, these positive things about cities, which I've spent much of my adult life saying, uh, then ran into this uh, in 2020. Um, plague is an old companion of urban life. Uh, the first well-documented urban plague occurred in 430 BCE, uh, the documentation was done by Thucydides, the plague was the plague of Athens, and of course, fifth century Athens does all that we could possibly expect a city to do. It's hard to imagine a place that brought together more genius, created more breakthroughs in a wider variety of fields than the Athens of, of Pericles. Now, all that success, all of those geniuses bickering on street corners and learning from one another in agoras, then it, it, it excites the rivalry of Sparta, right, which is a backdrop for the plague, uh, Sparta demands that uh, Athens step down from its leadership of the Delian League. Pericles, who is not one to take guff from, from anyone, uh, says no, and the Peloponnesian War is on. Pericles' cunning plan is to summon the Athenians and their Attic allies behind the walls of Athens, trusting to those walls to keep out the superior Spartan warriors, um, and then send out the also superior Athenian fleet to harass the Peloponnesian coastline. The strategy works militarily. But walls that keep out Spartan hoplites will not necessarily keep out bacteria or viruses. And that is indeed what happened. Through the port of Piraeus, some form of illness enters into 5th century Athens. Cities are vulnerable for, for pandemic for two very clear reasons, one of which is that they are in the nodes on our global lattice of travel, of travel and trade. They are the ports of entry for goods, for people, for ideas, and for viruses. Secondly, urban density enables the spread of at least some diseases more quickly. And that is certainly what happened in Athens. Perhaps one-fourth of Athens' population died over a two-year period. That would be a death rate approximately 100 times that that we experienced in COVID-19. And Thucydides describes a city where that has gone amok, in which people uh, live only for the day because they do not expect to, to see tomorrow. Um, Athens, of course, does survive this pandemic. It soldiers on in the Peloponnesian War for another quarter century. But its glory is, in some sense, <coughs> dimmed forever, and it becomes perhaps from moving from the New York City of the uh, Eastern Mediterranean to becoming, I don't know, the Philadelphia, the New Haven, whatever it is that you think, you think it, goes, it goes down to. Um, now, for plagues then, you know, the, the, you know, the sort of my, my takeaways from the, from the plagues of antiquities, uh, of antiquity are that the impact of the plagues is always and everywhere mediated by the strength of civil society at the moment when, in which it hits. Uh, the, the Athenian plague was, was difficult in part because the country was already, the city was already at risk, right? The city was already uh, facing these risks. The plague that hits the Roman Empire in the, the second century, uh, the Antonine Plague, is relatively, you know, it's a, a, another demographic catastrophe, maybe a quarter of the population that dies of the Roman Empire, but it's one in which during the period of five good emperors, when, you know, according to Gibbon, this was the best time that one could possibly live prior to his own 18th century, um, you know, it's the Roman Empire shrugs it off. The next century, the plague of Cyprian, far more uh, catastrophic because Rome has become far, far weaker, and it's one of the events that lead to the, the crisis of that century. The most extreme of these, at least according to some views, is the plague that comes in 541 CE to, uh, to Byzantium, to Constantinople. And the backstory for that, of course, is that Rome itself has fallen, uh, 473 CE, and uh, you know, the Eastern Roman Empire soldiers on. And it strikes, the plague strikes just at the moment in which the Eastern Roman Empire appears poised to re-exert control over the West, in which Justinian has sent out his great warlord, Belisarius, to conquer North Africa, to conquer Italy, to reimpose the Pax Romana on the Mediterranean world. Just at that moment, you have this catastrophic plague which comes in, and then the repeated waves. Uh, that one we know, that was Yersinia pestis. That's the first major outbreak of Black Plague uh, on the Black Death on European shores. And it is in the sort of maximalist interpretation that some historians have put on it. It's sort of the event that gives us the dark ages, right? This, this sort of repeated, repeated striking of, of plague. 
Now, for most of the last 670 or so ye years, we've been relatively, oh, somehow there I lost that graph. Uh, oh, there, it's there. Wait a minute, I just saw it. There. Uh, how did it get moved there? I don't know. Okay. Uh, for most of the past 750 years, we've been relatively, um, relatively, there have been plenty of pandemics, but we've managed to get through them. Um, in the 19th century, and these are, of course, death rates in New York City, the 19th century was a great era of proto-globalization, and it was also a great era of proto-plague. Uh, this shows death rates in New York City. You can see in the early 19th century, that's the period of yellow fever. Uh, and by the mid-19th century, that's the, that's the era of cholera. Uh, yellow fever, mosquito-borne illness, emerges out of Africa, goes over to the Caribbean, probably in the early 18th century, then comes up to the cities of the eastern seaboard. Um, cholera emerges in a particularly virulent form in 1817 in the Ganges Delta, gets carried along with the British Army, gets carried along with the Tsar's Army, makes its way to New York, you can see, in 1832. Um, death rates here are about 5%. Uh, at its height, so that's the 1832. So that's somewhere between 10 and 20 times the death rate from COVID-19. Uh, cholera, of course, is a waterborne illness. Now, despite these catastrophic events, the city continues to grow. Um, there are two good reasons for this. One of which is people were poor and they were put up there with the risk of death in order to get out of poverty. If your alternative is dying from starvation in Ireland, you know, the risk of, of cholera doesn't seem like such a terrible thing. Um, secondly, the city actually started investing. A couple of things that we should understand about the massive investments that cities and towns made in water and, and sewer infrastructure in the 19th century. First of all, in some sense, this is a hinge in history in which, for the first time in centuries, governments actually start doing something that doesn't involve killing people, right? This is actually the time in which, and I know we were talking about Voltaire earlier, and we know that, you know, we love we love Frederick the Great because of his witty conversations, his witty, his witty uh, dialogues with Voltaire. But let's face it, the man's main business was seizing land from Maria Theresa. I mean, this is what Frederick the Great did for a living, right? I mean, basically, was, was, was a warrior, war, which is basically what all of our governments did in the 18th century and, and earlier. In the 19th century, our urban governments came together here in New York and elsewhere, and they actually saved lives rather than taking them. And they saved lives by investing massive amounts. America's cities and towns spent more on clean water and sewers at the start of the 20th century than the federal government spent on everything except for the, clean, except for the army and the post office. Right? They spent an enormous amount, uh, and they actually made a difference. Second fact, they did this investment not because the they got the science right, but because they got the science wrong. Okay? They, there were two schools of thought in the early 19th century about pandemic, one of which emphasized uh, contagion. Right, which thought it was all about quarantines, keeping people apart, the other which emphasized miasma. Remember miasma, the stuff comes out of the ground? Right? Thank goodness the miasma guys won, okay? even though they got the, the science completely wrong because the miasma guy's prescription was drain the swamp, getting clean water, right? build aqueducts, get rid of the standing water, right? and that actually made a huge difference. So they got the public health right even though they got it, they got it wrong. Um, third fact to keep in mind. I was raised, I was raised, I was born on this island, I was raised in this island on a tale of engineering triumphalism. That New York had been a fetid swamp until the good engineers <coughs> built the quote aqueduct and the clean water came in and the fetid water went out. You can see immediately from this graph that that is in fact at best a half truth. Croton Aqueduct is opened in 1842. You can still see that there are cholera outbreaks for 25 years after that. My great, 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 great grandfather died in the 1849 one, okay, of cholera. Um, this, uh, it only starts changing after 1866. The reason for this is, in fact, this Metropolitan Board of Health. And this is the brainchild of a guy called Dr. Stephen Smith, who is one of the heroes of public health in U.S. history. Stephen Smith was, you know, a great documenter of the many, you know, flagrant sort of abuses of basic medical practices. Um, he does this in a great report during the Civil War. And then what the Board of Health starts doing is they start actually imposing Peruvian taxes on tenement owners who don't connect to the water system. Because, in fact, what New Yorkers are doing is exactly what's happening in, in Sub-Saharan Africa today, which is they've got a last mile problem. We've built aqueducts, right? We don't have any sort of particular subsidy to connect to the water system. We have free hydrants. I think maybe 2,000 in the island of Manhattan. But water is expensive to carry, right? It's difficult. It's heavy. And so poor people continue to do this sh use their shallow, you know, shallow wells. They continue to use their pet latrines. And they continue to die, right? And anyone who sort of you know, got involved in Millennium Development Account building, you know, water pipes, building water mains in sub-Saharan Africa and didn't know that history, right, 
might then also have been surprised by the fact that there was a heck of a last mile problem over the last 20 years in Sub-Saharan Africa. But in fact, our own history should have told us that unless we had some mechanism for either finding people or subsidizing people to get them to connect, we weren't gonna, we weren't gonna solve that problem. But as you can see, uh, over, you know, death rates did come down. And we had, after 1919, a blessed century in which pandemic was basically gone. And then this happened, right? And then, then COVID-19 uh, came out again, came out again. And we again were hit with, this, uh, hit with this plague. Now, it was different. It was different in a couple of ways from the things that we've had in the past. First of all, um, it started in a very similar way to the earlier plagues, in the sense that it was urban America that was hit first, right? And um, it was a, a, you know, it was New York, it was Boston, it was uh, Atlanta, it was New Orleans, it was Detroit. Um, but it didn't spread in the dense parts of cities more. And this is from a paper of mine with uh, Caitlin Gorbach and Stephen Redding that was in the Journal of Urban Economics uh, Insights section. Um, it's sort of an interesting thing because it, this is the first time we had really finely tuned uh, data about mobility during COVID. Um, and this is what cases looked like in the five boroughs of Manhattan as of, let's say, June 1, 2020, so relatively early on. And you can see it's not as all as, at all as if the most densely packed parts of the city are the ones where the cases were the highest. This is, this is the opposite of you know, history, where you know, it was the dense tenement areas that had the highest levels of disease. It's the opposite of Mumbai in 2020, where the remarkable uh, uh, serological work of Anut Milani shows us that there were you know, more than 50% of residents of Mumbai slums had been exposed to COVID by July of 2020. Right, so that you can't, there's no hiding in Islam, right? And so they, they, got the, they got the illness really quickly. But as you can see, you know, it's the Bronx, it's the outer parts of Queens, and it's Staten Island. Staten Island, right, that has the highest case rate. Um, why is that? Well, it gets down to essential and non-essential workers, as was discussed earlier. This is the change in mobility, same map. Um, so the, uh, you know, the, the decline in mobility was much sharper in the inner boroughs than it was in the outer boroughs. We now have all the safe graph data, which enables us to look at mobility. And our estimates, we use the, uh, as sources of pseudo-exogenous variation, we use things like the, the industrial, the occupational mix of these areas before, uh, before COVID, but are uh, interacted with, with the weeks. Our estimates are that a 10% reduction in trips during this time period was associated with a 20% reduction in uh, disease prevalence. So the, the shutting down of mobility during the earlier time period. Now that's a coefficient that I believe for that time period, that was a period where we didn't have masks, where we didn't have vaccines. It's not as all, all one that necessarily re is relevant for today. Um, but the mobility ends up being a very stark thing. Now, um, why were these boroughs so different? Well, we know who lives in those different parts of them. We know where essential workers live and we know where knowledge workers live. And it's, uh, uh, the ability to sort of isolate, particularly the educated, was another really remarkable thing about this plague and a very different thing about this plague than many uh, previous plagues. Um, but it's really important to remember that as much as you know, s some economists we wander around talking about how the, wor the work from home is now ubiquitous and normal, right? Uh, it's a very elite phenomenon. During May 2020, which was the height of teleworking from home because of COVID, 68.9% of Americans with advanced degrees worked remotely, 5% of high school dropouts worked remotely, right? 15.3% uh, of Americans with no college degrees but a high school diploma worked remotely. Um, and last year, in 2021, well, a year and a half ago, which is the last CPS year that we have, what share of Americans predominantly worked from home? 17.9%, right? according to the census. Right, that's, that's, that's our number. So 83% did not predominantly work from home during that, during that year. And that was still very much of a COVID year. Um, this then creates uh, this phenomenon, which I find absolutely striking. Um, it is a fact that basically everything about America's cities that's good tends to load on education. And COVID death rates load very strongly on education. And the thing is, it's not just the very high correlation coefficient. It's like the scale of these axes. many people COVID has killed based on the education level of these, of these areas. I mean, that's, that's just an extraordinary gap uh, in terms of these things. Um, next thing I'm just going to say something about quickly, um, the will we go, ever go back to work question. Um, and certainly, the New York numbers on offices are still strikingly low. This is uh, the Castle Back to Work barometer. This is about key swipes going into fancy office buildings. Uh, they give you this data. They're still giving it to you. 
Uh, these numbers are certainly not 17.9%. These numbers are 60% out, right? 40% uh, people showing up on a, on a regular basis in these, in these uh, cities. Um, the, and, and you can see it's, you know, all the top 10 markets, it's, bi it's big. It's much less big if you look at Google Mobility. Um, so these are the five largest cities in the U.S. They're not quite cities. It's actually the largest county in each city. So this is actually the Manhattan, not, not New York City, Maricopa County, not Phoenix. Um, these are, show less of a gap in most of them. So Houston is at the top, only down 20% in mobility. So this is workplace trips relative to pre-pandemic. That's what the Google mobility numbers tell you. Um, the bulk of the cities are around 30% down. So again, that's a, that's a difference than the 18%, but the 18% is predominant. So this would include all the people not showing up on, on week. Uh, no, it wouldn't actually. This is as to the Wednesday of each week. So this is 30% down on the Wednesday and 40% down for New York, for Manhattan. So Manhattan is, Manhattan is lower. Um, uh, I do know this is, Nick Bloom did, this was from a discussion I did of uh, Nick's Brookings paper uh, last year. Nick did a work from home survey globally. Um, and the thing is about these surveys is they're all internet surveys. And so you've got to question yourself about how representative these are in terms of different populations. And Nick's worked reasonably hard to sort of make the case that they're representative in the US. Uh, and certainly relative to the Google mobility data, they look okay. So this was my attempt to simulate with Google mobility data what he should have gotten in terms of the number of work days working from home in terms of, of his survey. Um, this is on the survey along this is axis. This is my Google mobility simulation. The line is the 45 degree line. So the line tells you you got exactly right. Um, so Sweden and Italy, it's, they're exactly matching. Again, this is uh, early 2021, in fact. Um, the uh, US is reasonably close. Uh, Russia and Ukraine, oh no, it was early 2022, so this was actually just when the war was starting. So Russia and Ukraine actually had, uh, had less people going to the office than his survey said should have done so. But all of the poor countries, which actually have more people going to the office than they did pre-COVID, right, don't match up at all. In part because his samples of, of Indians look nothing like the actual Indian, Indian labor force. They look like elite Indian knowledge workers. Um, so, and that's another sort of important thing for us to think about, that this, this empty offices thing, this is a wealthy US knowledge worker thing. It's not a global phenomenon in the sense that, ca that captures the poor parts of the world. Why am I uh, skeptical about the view that we're gonna give up on workplaces and the cities that enable them? Partially because for 40 years, I have lived in the shadow of Alvin Toffer, who wrote in 1980 about how information technology would make offices in the cities that enable those face-to-face -face interactions and offices to exist, that all that information technology would make that obsolete. For 40 of those years, he's been completely wrong, okay? And uh, I think there were good reasons why rising and increasing returns to knowledge would bring us back closer together. I didn't think all of a sudden that Zoom was gonna change all of that. But, you know, let's, let's I, I, you know, I, I've been wrong before, I could be wrong again. Um, a couple of facts that we have from this, and this is actually the same fact that was in Nick Bloom's original paper on the dynamic effects of going remotely. So this is in some sense Alfred Marshall in, in real time, about ideas being in the air. Um, and Matthew and Harrington are sort of doing a, a US version of Nick's Chinese uh, call center workers. They both find exactly the same thing. Short run, no impact on cyber risk. Long run, promotion rates drop by 50%. Okay. Um, promotion for, uh, case, in the Emmanuel Harrington case, means you get assigned to handle the digital calls. How would you learn how to handle the digital calls if you never went to the office? How would your boss learn to learn to handle the digital calls if you went to the office, right? All of the learning channels that you get from being exposed to other people, right, are shut down. Second thing, second fact. This is from um, Sonia Jaffe, is our student, uh, work using Microsoft data. Um, I'm just going to read you from the, from the abstract. Um, uh, they're looking at basically all the Microsoft workers. Uh, uh, oh, our, our results show that firm-wide remote work caused the collaboration network of workers to become more static and siloed with fewer bridges between disparate parts. Furthermore, there was a decrease in synchronous communication and an increase in asynchronous communication. Together, these effects may make it harder for employees to acquire and share new information across the network. Third fact, um, this is a nice piece by uh, Jose Ramon Morasaria and Carlos Dabawin. This looked at new postings and employment in remotable and non-remotable occupations using the uh, classic Dingle and Neyman uh, classification of these things. Um, Non-remotable jobs, employment drops during the early pandemic, new postings on burning glass also drop, they both come back up. Remotable jobs, employment stays steady, new postings collapse and stay down. So, you know, even though Microsoft told us in uh, 2020 that their programmers were just as productive as whole as, as they were at, at work, 
New postings on Burning Glass for programmers were down by 42% between the beginning and the end of 2020. People were not willing to onboard new workers remotely, which is compatible with a view that the learning channel is shut down. People were not willing to sort of get them embedded in their culture if they're not gonna come in live. Um, the final piece of evidence on this is just what a disaster real remote learning was, right? Which we have now reams of evidence on how, you know, trying to teach kids remotely um, worked out. Um, I'm going to talk about four things now for, and uh, how much time do I have? Okay, I'm just going to keep on going. Uh, okay. Um, uh, four things that I've been somewhat obsessed about, one of which is the losses from the missing interactions. And so you heard from Alain, like uh, the, the whole point of cities to enable interactions. So I'm going to talk about three th types of things that create you know, missing interactions. The first of which, and I'm just going to skim over this because this is in some sense a, a longer theme of mine, is just the fact that we've got too many people in the wrong place in the US. Okay? So this, is, this was my you know, obsession as, as being America's largest unsolved social problem prior to COVID-19. So when I was born in 1967, one in 20 prime age males were jobless for most of the past 15 years. More than 15% of prime age males have been jobless. Right? Joblessness is, is far worse by almost all of our measures than actually being a low-wage worker. Uh, Joblessness is much more associated with suicide, with family dissolution, with opioid use, and so on. And because, of course, having a job doesn't just mean having an income, it means having a sense of purpose and social connection. There is a very clear spatial pattern in this. American joblessness is epicentered in, the Amer in America's eastern heartland in a broad swath that starts down in Louisiana and Mississippi, runs up through Appalachia, and ends in the cities of the Rust Belt. Okay. Um, and before COVID-19, I was sort of you know, convinced that this city would provide employment opportunities for people who didn't have advanced degrees from MIT, right, in the vast urban service sector, in the 32 million Americans who worked in leisure, hospitality, and retail trade. What I couldn't figure out was what the heck they were gonna do in West Virginia, right? What, what, would, what future was there for less skilled workers in the parts of America where they couldn't be Uber drivers for, you know, Wall Street financiers or uh, uh, fancy lawyers? I'm still obsessed by that. Um, the, um, one of the reasons why they stay there there are many reasons. Probably the most important is the informal social safety net. 35% of those prime age men are living in their parents' houses, right? But bulk of the rest of them have some other wage earner who they are, you know, they are, who's taking care of them. Um, one of the reasons, though, is that we don't build in places that are successful. So here I am sorting areas based on what Raj Chetty tells me is how well they function in turning poor kids into rich adults. So this is on the basis of upward mobility. And I'm just showing you the relationship between that and the level of land use regulations according to the Wharton Land Use uh, Survey. So this just shows you that the better the place is at generating upward mobility for poor kids, the more it tends to regulate new building. The more difficult it tends to make it possible for families to find uh, their future there. So um, <coughs> second point is just in cities. So this is an odd fact. It's a fact that I, I don't really like very much. Uh, on this side, this is fine. I like this fact. This is a relationship between uh, per capita GDP and population density across America's metropolitan areas. That fact we know. This is the fa same correlation with Raj's upward mobility data. Okay? So whereas America's big, dense metropolitan areas right, seem to do wonderful things for engendering you know, productivity for adults, and not just in a static sense, in a, in a dynamic sense as well, for engendering wage growth for adult workers who come to cities, they seem to be doing a very bad thing for ki kids who grow up in those areas. And wait, it gets worse. So if you look at neighborhood density within cities, right, the denser the neighborhood, the worse the, kid the kid's upward mobility is. That's on this one. And, um, oh, skip that. They, they, there is a hint for this, which is this is African American mobility against the degree of segregation in areas. And certainly one of the hypotheses is that cities look bad for poor kids because they enable more segregation, more of those missing interactions than do smaller towns. Uh, last fact on, on this within city stuff, I have two more facts on this, um, is this is just the extent to which mobility jumps up at the geographic edge of big city school districts. So this is just if you, if you live right outside a big city school district versus right inside in terms of your upper mobility, this is the same big city school district. Here I'm looking at your probability of being incarcerated as an adult. Okay, um, big jump down. One hypothesis for this, and this, this is, was our attempt to do something about it, but I'm, I'm not even, I don't think I really have time to explain this. The hypothesis, that, but it, we attempted to use cell phone records to differentiate the interactivity of adults and kids. The hypothesis is that if you're an adult living in New York, right, you, you, know, you may live in a highly segregated neighborhood, but you're likely to come to work 
in relatively integrated business. Certainly that's what the experienced segregation work of Susan Athey and Matt Jenskow have showed. That in fact, the segregation that you get from just counting like residences does not capture the lives of, of typical workers who will work in a place like this often or work real close to, to a place like this. By contrast, a kid who grows up in a housing project, right, will go to a segregated school, will play with kids in, in their neighborhood, right? And uh, this just shows the extent to which um, for adults and students, if you just look at the number of unique locations that students go to according to their cell phone record, it falls off a cliff as you go to denser areas. The adult number is, is much more steady. And if you look at adults versus kids, adults spend more time at work. When they live in a dense area, according to cell phone records, kids spend less time uh, at school. Um, but this issue of cities being actually non-interactive places for kids feels to me like a, like a relatively huge thing. Continue with the interaction and the segregation theme. Um, the, the, probably the, the poorest place where we can actually trust the administrative data on earnings is Brazil. Um, once you get too much poorer than Brazil, you can't do stuff like that uses the race data from Brazil that actually looks at the sort of universe of formal workers. There's a lot of work in the paper, uh, uh, which is joint with Radu Bartz and uh, Cesar Hidalgo and a number of other people. Um, uh, to show that the, that the race administrative data, which is kind of comparable to various other data sets that we have in the US, is not a bad representation of things. Um, we are able to do what De La Roca and Puga do with their Spanish data and basically estimate a short-term impact of living in cities, a longer-term impact in living in cities. It's less in Brazil, uh, but it's really different in the north and in the south of Brazil. So, you know, you see you go from a 0.014 coefficient on log population initial to 0.022, but not only is the, the north you know, much less. Uh, it interacts with uh, the initial premium so that it basically gets rid of it. And so the southern cities of Brazil, which, you know, often feel European, so this is Sao Paulo, this is Rio, these, these are places that they seem to be functioning, doing traditional urban jobs, turning poor people into richer people. The northern cities do not. Now, why not? What's different about the northern cities? Well, one thing that's really different is that they are much more economically segregated, okay? And, um, it, it's not that they're, they're so much less well-educated. They've actually got a lot of educated people in northern cities. Often they're, they're disproportionately educated. They work disproportionately in the public sector. Okay? They're not part of the same private sector firm. The, the third variable down there, the exposure of low-skill to high-skill within company at the micro-region level, so I can actually do that using this, this data, um, that basically kills off, both the nor kills off the north dummy pretty much completely. And actually, the impact, the positive impact of cities seems to be coming primarily from the interaction between less skilled and more skilled people in the workplace. So it's exactly this notion that it's the mixing that's actually serving something, something positive on this. Um, and this just shows over here, you have the relationship, the, 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 these ones are the north, the red ones are the south, blue is the north, red is the south. This is a relationship with log population. And these are the two lines of exposure of low skill to high skill on, on wages. And this is really showing the sort of this, this integration really feels like it's, it's crucial to this. Uh, last point I want to make about inter interactions, and, and here I want to pivot to gender. Um, this is work, joint work with Nava Ashraf and Alexia Delfino. Um, the benefits of urban interaction are, again, limited if we're not able to work collaboratively and trust one another. This is why rule of law is such a complement to urban life. This is why good institutions are such a complement to urban life, right? I mean, our first you know, urban code right, is Hammurabi, right? This goes back to the dawn, of, the dawn of law. Women are disproportionately at risk from male expropriation. This comes you know, both because of sexual exploitation and it comes because of violence, right? And for, for these reasons, uh, it often becomes harder for women, particularly in developing world cities, to actually cooperate with males and to get the benefits that would come from cooperating with, with men. Um, courts may also be biased against women, although our own, our own work seems to suggest that sort of the absence of courts is even worse. Um, and consequently, the benefits of cities may be lower for women. Um, the work that, and uh, we have a model in this paper. The model suggests that if you're a female entrepreneur, you can lose out either because of existing gender, you know, gender biases or because of uh, a failure to enforce contracts. Both of these things can lose. One of them actually hurts you in terms of the anti-bargaining. The other second one costs you in terms of ex post expropriation. And the, data, the model sort of suggests that you need to have both uh, relatively little discrimination and relatively good contracts to have uh, a reasonable number of female entrepreneurs. 
when I look at that graph, that seems to be what I see. That sort of the top quadrant, which is good contracts, low discrimination, has 36% uh, of females of uh, businesses in the World Bank Enterprise Survey are owned by um, women in that quadrant as opposed to 22, 22, and, and 18. But our real work in this paper involves uh, looking at a, a survey of a census, it's actually a complete census of businesses in Lusaka in Zambia. And so this is, you know, this is our, our whole thing. Um, we document a couple of things. First of all, as is true almost throughout the world, women tend to concentrate in a very small number of industries where they often have the ability to work with other women. Um, apparel manufacturing is dominant, then followed by food manufacturing, but you know, everywhere else it, it really becomes vanishingly small. Um, we uh, are able to measure uh, just their cooperation and uh, different things, jointly buying, lending, giving advice, sharing orders, uh, and average cooperation. Uh, in apparel, where there are lots of women, women and men are the same. In every other industry, men do a lot more cooperating than women do. Okay? And we've, of course, done a fair amount of, uh, we've, we've, like, I've gone out and interviewed them. I have not. They, my co-authors have spent a lot of time talking to entrepreneurs in, in female entrepreneurs in Zambia. Uh, and the, the, this is exactly the story. This model, this paper, came out of those discussions. Came out of like, why don't I interact with men? It's because they steal my stuff and they try to make, you know, they, they try bad things. This is actually my favorite graph in this paper, although it's just a simple fact. Again, inspired as I've been my entire life by uh, Alpha Marcus' story of learning from people around me. How do men, you know, learn how to do their jobs? Well, you know, 40% from family members, a quarter from the entrepreneur and some, uh, some from the same business. So, you know, a bunch of entrepreneurs in other areas. Are they learning much formally? No, they're not learning anything formal. That's not what they do. How are women learning? Overwhelmingly, they're learning formally. They're going to some kind of a class, right? Entrepreneur in another business, a thin sliver. Entrepreneur in the same business, a thin sliver. All of those interactions, which are sort of the, this positive source of knowledge for men, women aren't getting in this, in this place. Again, the sort of fear of expropriation, the rack of the rule of law feels crucial. We look at a couple of things here, and I'm going to do two things very quickly on this to try and make this case that rule of law matters. First of all, there's a naturally occurring institution in Lusaka which creates some level of rule of law, which are these markets. Markets have market chiefs. Market chiefs are there to enforce contracts. They are also actually you know, typically biased against women, but there are better market chiefs and worse market chiefs, and sort of all market chiefs seem to be better than the absence of a market chief, which is just pure anarchy. Um, we are able to show uh, that, you know, when you are in a female predominantly market, the, which, is, which are these ones, women actually cooperate slightly more than men do, right? When you're in a male uh, predominantly market, um, the, men, the men cooperate more, but it's not so terrible. Outside the market, the women don't cooperate at all, right? I mean, it's, it's just a tiny fraction. The, other th the last thing that we do is we uh, ran a trust game, right? So this is the classic, you know, you pass over a certain amount of money that gets multiplied and gets sent back, but the other person can steal it from you. We gave women access to a de-biased chief, a chief who wouldn't know their, their, uh, uh, their gender, who could enforce their, the promises that were made to them. And what you see is really a very substantial in the control, right? Men trust much more than women do in the treatment where you give them chief, that, that's eliminated entirely. And returns to everyone go up. Uh, for the female investors when you, have, uh, when you have access to a chief. Last thing I'm going to say, I'm just going to finish on this, is uh, I'm going to say something from, from new work uh, of mine on infrastructure. Uh, and it's really, it's not about interaction, but it is about sort of taking care of our cities and, and tending them. Um, and of course, you know, I mean, this is Dara V, which is about as interactive a place as I can imagine, but it's also a place which sort of highlights the failures of infrastructure. Um, one of this is this the first graph I'm going to show you is going to motivate what comes next is by Ram Singh. And what he does is he measures road roughness on PPP roads and non PPP roads in India. Now, what PPP roads are these public private partnership roads, these are actually highways between, between cities. And what's interesting is opposed to the PPP roads in the US or in Chile, it's not like these are set aside in some totally different road. You're on one road, you're going to, you're going to the Taj Mahal. You're like, for one kilometer, you're on a PPP road, and, and then you're on a non-PPP road, and you didn't pay any money, and it nothing else changed, okay? The difference is the PPP roads are smooth, the non-PPP roads are not, and this is what the, just the IRI, the International Roughness Index measures that, that Ram has gathered shows. Um, we have 
measures of IRI, and this comes from joint work with Gabriel Kreindler and uh, Lindsay Currier, we have such highway grades for the US. Uh, it comes from the Department of Transportation for highways and arterial roads. Because for 40 years, the Department of Transportation has been sending out trucks at 3 a.m. in the morning, driving them at a constant speed and gathering road roughness. Um, this is a, a great fact. This is in a paper that Gilles and Matt uh, published in a, in, a, uh, you know, in, a, in a volume that Jim Turbin and I edited. These are the American Society of Civil Engineers highway grades, and they're grades in the usual 4.0 thing. So we've gone, America went from in the 80s, we, had like a, we were getting like a B minus in our highway grades. Now we've been getting Ds for like the last 20 years. Um, that's actually what happened to road roughness over the same time period. Our highways got much smoother over the same time period that the, the American Society of Civil Engineers was downgrading us from a B minus to an F. You might even think that they were an interest group arguing for more spending on their services. You might even think that that was something that was going through their, their heads. Uh, I banish the thought. I, I, um, okay, but he, here's the problem for, I mean, that was a highway grade, so it's fair to make fun of them over that. But I can tell you in my daily commute, I, you know, I, I take an hour dropping off my son on my way to, way to work. Like, the part of my commute that's on the highway, that's nice. That's actually smooth. Every other road is a nightmare. I mean, in, in <laughs> by Boston by, by March, right? Our roads have been torn apart by, by this stuff. But we don't have measures of this, or we didn't. We do now. Uh, for one month in uh, one year, I have the universe of Uber ping data. And Uber ping data comes five, five times a second, and they give you the geolocation of each driver, not just in two dimensions, but in three, which means that I can measure road roughness everywhere in the country because I know this, the standard deviation of vertical acceleration uh, in every road in America. I'm just going to show you a little bit about this. Um, okay, so uh, first of all, it's a little bit trickier than when Uber data is a little bit trickier than if, the, if you're just sending out your truck at 3 a.m. Because Uber drivers drive at different speeds, and when you drive fast your roads, your cars bump you. That, that, of course, happens. And so you basically have to filter out the impact of this. Now, we have so much data that that's not all that hard to do. But uh, it's, and it's roughly a linear relationship. We actually estimate sort of it's a segment-specific uh, road uh, uh, relationship that we, that we estimate for every sort of a segment is a block. So every block gets its own slope. This is kind of what the data looks like. This is one. Like, this is one trip. And the amazing thing, of course, is there are many more data points in this trip than there are all GDP figures in US history, right? I mean, it's just like one, one road thing is just insane. This is actually a trip from downtown Chicago to uh, O'Hare, OK? You see it starts bumpy downtown Chicago, then it gets uh, smooth on the highway, and then it gets bumpy again. And this is roughly what road roughness looks like in Chicago. Um, within Cook County as a whole, predominantly African-American neighborhoods have um, roads that are 0.6 standard deviations rougher than predominantly white neighborhoods. Um, this is our relationship with international roughness. This is our measure, our Uber roughness measure, our, our standard deviation of vertical acceleration. We're um, correlating this with the uh, IRI measure for the highways and arterial roads that we get from, from DOT. So we get from the Department of Transportation. So these things correlate reasonably well. We have less, a less good co correlation with the New York uh, cover the New York index of, of road roughness. But the New York index actually doesn't come from running roads. It comes from pictures. So they actually, New York, like most cities, has aerial photographs. And on the basis of those aerial photographs, they decide things. Right, now, our, so we only have a 0.25 correlation with that. But we put in both measures in terms of speeds on uh, New York roads. And our, um, uh, and we did the 75th percentile of speed because we wanted it to be relatively uh, free from congestion. Our R squared on speed is 28%. Uh, the New York City measure is less than 1%. So I think there's a lot more no noise in their measure than there is actually in our measure. And if you put both in, they both have some uh, degree of, of impact, but ours is much stronger uh, than theirs is. Um, and of course, you know, this is what happens with road repaving events in Chicago. Uh, so you can see the, the roughness goes up a little and goes down, speed goes down a little and goes up. One thing that's striking is these are in standard deviations of our road roughness measure. These are tiny changes with road repaving. And uh, I'll show you why that is in a second. But road repaving in Chicago seems to do strikingly little to road roughness. Using both repaving events and border discontinuities, we're able to estimate how speeds change with roughness. 
Um, and we're able to estimate, um, if you're willing to give me a little model that wraps around that, I can go from there to actually the total social, the total private cost of, r of road roughness on you. Because in some sense, your slowing down shows your willingness to pay to avoid vertical bumps. So I can get that from, from, from this. Um, I get a larger coefficient for uh, the border discontinuities than elsewhere. You can see this is fairly clear. So these are, these are bin scatter graphs, but you know, big jump down. Uh, in terms of predicted roughness, about, about 0.5 standard deviation. So a much larger jump at the Chicago border than there is from re road repaving, and a big jump up in terms of speeds. This is, if you use our model, this is the distribution of road segment roughness in the US uh, in z-scores. And this is the time cost in US dollars per mile without any roughness. This is just the, the this is going on city blocks. This is just using assuming a $15 value of time. Uh, and then this is how much the road roughness adds to that. So, you know, somewhere around here it adds maybe about 13, 14 cents per mile of, of adding on to this. You can then multiply that by uh, 10,000 miles if you want to for, for an average household. That's a little bit cheating because 10,000 to 15,000 miles is not a crazy number for an American household, but very few people drive 10 to 15,000 miles on city streets as opposed to on highways. So it's probably fair or, or less than fair for a cabbie, right, who actually does experience this, but for an average person who's driving 15,000 miles in the US, the average, the average city road does not capture the average roughness. This is sort of the macro geography of this. So um, coasts are much worse than in the interior, partially because coasts have a lot more time where they go, they're going from below 32 degrees to above 30 degrees and back again. Right? The freezing and unfreezing of ground is, is, is really difficult for, uh, for roads. This is in the New York, New Jersey metro area, the relationship with log income across cities. Uh, this is a, just a, a bar chart version of it, road roughness by median town income. This is uh, race and New York City. Uh, this is race and roughness nationally. It's, it's still positive, it's, it's, uh, uh, but it's less. This is road roughness in New Manhattan and in Chicago, and these are the five boroughs. Sort of like we're in one of the worst areas right now. Downtown Manhattan is, is really dismal according to these measures, uh, but so is, so is the South Bronx as well. Um, and I'll show you my last fact, which is my favorite fact of this entire thing. This is uh, an explanation for why there was such a little change in road roughness in Chicago. This is initial road roughness and your probability of being repaved in the next eight months. You will see that the bottom three deciles are genuinely repaved less. So it's moved the 30% of roads are repaved less. Among the roughest 70%, there is zero correlation between how rough you are and whether or not you're likely to be repaved there. And so the suggestion, and I cannot prove that this is suboptimal, right? Because like repaving is in the next. And like it's hard to know exactly how to do this, right? But if I were betting, I think the sense, what they're essentially doing is they've got the residual indices. The residual indices, they then have a rule that says that everything that points to residual indices index needs to be repaved. And then they actually only do 20% of that, and they do no targeting within that group. So that is certainly a, a hypothesis which is compatible with this, which is the cleanest 30% gets scooped out, but among the other 70%, there's basically no targeting. And if I were thinking about how to make America's infrastructure better, Right? The low-hanging fruit is just to target road repaving better rather than to you know, worry about spending massively more on different things. The other thing that actually is important in terms of the injury story, and I think this is just what Rom told us. So Rom's view is the reason why the PPP roads are so much smoother is not about a fancy incentive story that Eduardo Engel used to tell you about where you know, they get more revenue so they maintain them. They actually don't get more revenue. They're just paid as a concession by the state. The Rom story is they actually get more energy efficiency. Right? So they actually get much better roads built in this year, whereas the public Gets, uh, gets terrible roads. And I would just say my last thing, I, 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 I'm not talking about my paper last year in the AR on public procurement, but public procurement is 15% of GDP. It's incredibly important. It's done incredibly badly in, in the US, but it is in fact a, a hugely important topic for the future of cities. So thank you very much. I'm glad to be here and I will.